let's get started. Uh, right on time, actually, 30 seconds before. Uh, welcome, everybody. My name is uh, Sean Chen. It's kind of hard. Just call me Sean. Everybody call me Sean. I work for Google. And standing next to me is Shin. Hi, my name is uh, Shin Yang. I work for uh, VMware in the Cloud Native Storage team. I'm also a co-chair of the Kubernetes Stick Storage and working in the Data Protection Wing group with Shang Chen. We have a long agenda to go today, so we'll try to go fast. Uh, the agenda is mainly to deep dive into a couple of clips, into this whole data protection working group, or what are we doing, uh, what kind of progress have we made so far, and uh, what problems are we trying to solve. As usual, we'll start with the motivation, then move on to the organizations that has been involved and are actually uh, pretty actively act in, uh, contributing to this uh, working group, and give this group here a little bit key updates, what has happened in the past year or two, and then we loop into the caps, right? Those are the individual caps. And lastly, we'll close with uh, how you folks can get involved. Cool. Uh, you, I believe everybody over here has been uh, either a user of Kubernetes or an uh, active contributor of the community. So uh, you probably are pretty aware of the uh, fundamental constructs to support stateful workloads in the Kubernetes environment, <laughs> namely uh, persistent volume claims. Those are the user-facing API that gives you a volume. Uh, as well as uh, workload APIs like stateful set, um, deployment, et cetera, et cetera, which in any of these open APIs as of today, it allows you to attach a volume to your workload. And when your workload, you bring down your workload and bring it back again, your volume persists. So your data is not lost during the process. Uh, another trend is that some of you, I think, I uh, recognize going to the um, data in Kubernetes meeting on Monday. Right? The trend is pretty obvious. So more and more stateful workload is moving into Kubernetes world. Initially, the Kubernetes actually has been built in a state where uh, you can safely bring down and bring up your application at any given point in time, and it scales for you. But uh, not a, not a very a fundamental problem to solve over here for stateful workload is actually how do I make sure my data is not in, uh, it's, it's protected properly. So day two operations for now in Kubernetes is actually still uh, having a couple of gaps over there. Uh, there are tools there by saying that, right? Like for example, GitOps is very popular as of today to allow you save your configuration into a Git repository uh, while uh, still <clears throat> allow you to do application rollback and upgrade failures, recovery, et cetera, et cetera. However, the main gaps has been noticed and found in the areas where we want to do application level consistency, snapshot, or backup of your system, and then the restoration pieces along with your data stored in your uh, persistent volumes. So this is the entire motivation of this working group is to provide or build or design the basic components to support stateful application uh, protections in the Kubernetes environment. With that, these are the list of uh, organizations and the contributors from these organizations are very uh, active in this uh, working group. So if you're interested, and if, you, if you're interested, feel free to reach out to us too. Key updates. So in the past year or so, uh, this is a very hot topic, first of all, because it is really challenging, and there are very mature uh, commercial products for VM workloads in terms of uh, database running on VMs, et cetera, et cetera. But in Kubernetes, uh, not a lot has been done until now uh, in this area. So we published the first ever white paper in the community, this one of the key things I think uh, a lot of people can benefit from this white paper is how, what are the kind of you know, uh, modern applications that consider or are moving to Kubernetes environment, and what are the mechanisms 
those applications uses to protect the work, uh, to protect the data. That includes relational databases, message queues, or a key value store. A key value, a key value stores. Um, in this, this is a very long white paper. So if you're interested, please get, take a look at that. And then there's an annual report which documents all the cats that the working group has been tracking uh, in the past year or two. And also we provide all the previous talks and links uh, in this slide set. Uh, if you're interested, feel free to take a look. Cool. With that, this is a very busy slide. I'm not going to dive too much into that, but conceptual-wise, it, uh, it gives you a rough idea how application backup can happen to achieve application consistency in a Kubernetes environment. Uh, again, I'm not going to dive, dive too deep into this, uh, but the key point I want to point out is that there are green labeled components which are already available, and the blue ones are workflows, and orange and yellow ones are either in progress or still being designed. So you can see uh, there's one important one called COSI, which is already alpha in 1.25. This provides you the ability to provision a bucket and grant access in a Kubernetes environment, supporting right now, I think, a couple of vendors, GCP, uh, AWS, as well as Azure. Uh, and then the volume model convention is right now in alpha. This is more about the backup workflow. And the, on the restoration part, this is the, the, another kind of busy slide. Uh, not diving too much, but highlighting COSI, which serves as the source where you store your backup, as well as the volume populator, which allows you to plug in uh, any specific, Windows specific implementations to do a volume restoration at one time. Uh, with that, I'm gonna wrap up and start deep diving into each of these caps. Uh, this is the first one, volume model convention. Uh, some of you may be aware, uh, as of today, the volume snapshot feature allows you to take a snapshot of a, a persistent volume in your Kubernetes cluster, right? This is a point in time snapshot of your, uh, of your data. Uh, it allows you to also restore a block volume into a file system volume and vice versa. However, this is an interesting dilemma over here where the volume model transition can actually introduce vulnerability to the kernel, and this is considered to be a CVE. So what happens is that if you DD, for example, a block volume, or you just touch it and maybe put some malware on a block volume and take a snapshot of it, and you accidentally restore it into a file system volume, and that will cause your kernel to crash. Right? Uh, we don't want that because that crashed the entire node. So uh, on the flip side, this is actually in a great need feature of backup vendors. So backup vendors, what they want to do is, I will take a snapshot of your file system volume. However, I want to do a very efficient volume backup, meaning that I only want to back up the data that changed in the past, in between two snapshots. And that, in order for them to do that, they want to introduce something called like a block differences calculation where in vast majority of implementations, really just calculate the hash value of the block devices and try to see, okay, if there's anything changed, I will back it up, otherwise I'll just leave it there. So uh, this is a great, it's a neater feature, however, introduce vulnerability. So uh, in our volume snapshot, so we introduced this volume convention model to, uh, of course, we want to fix the CVE, right? So basically the idea is in the volume snapshot content resource right now, there's a field called source volume model. It tells you whether your snapshot is coming from a block device or a snapshot, uh, is the snapshot is coming from a file system volume. And then if I, uh, adding this model, the behavior becomes when you do a restoration, uh, if the source volume is a block volume and you're restoring into a file system volume, it will not work, it will block you. However, you know, to support the backup systems, right, there's a, a special way of uh, tricking in the system by adding an annotation. This is a very supported, uh, well-supported annotation that allows you to actually do the transition. Uh, this is basically, uh, basically open the door, not close, close the door entirely for backup system because the assumption is that they know exactly what they're doing. So to prevent uh, the uh, kernel attack from happening in the beginning. Uh, right now, this is 
in the uh, alpha stage in 1.24, and we have the cap and the block list over there. Uh, great thanks to Renat, who has been working on this for, uh, I think, a couple of months, because this in involves uh, API change in the volume snapshot content. Uh, moving, moving on, this is an interesting one called volume populator. So what exactly we need to do is here is you can, as of today, you can create a PVC by providing a reference as a source in the original PVC API. Uh, however, this source currently only supports volume snapshot, right? Uh, volume snapshot in many storage vendors is just a point in time local snapshot of your system. It does not necessarily back up your data. It depends on the vendor's implementation, but if your cluster crashes or your storage system crashes, you still don't have the ability to recover it. So what do we do in this case is really to back up your data out of your storage appliance to, uh, let's say, uh, a bucket, object storage bucket, or a different uh, appliance. Uh, in order to support that, we need to kind of, you know, uh, introduce a mechanism to allow the vendors to be able to uh, read the backup data and restore into the volume you want to uh, you want to use later on after your uh, disaster recovery or a disaster or your application failure. Uh, in order to do this, right, we need the uh, in order for the vendor to support it, we need a CRD that supports a specific data source reference in the PVC. This is a newly added field. Uh, right now, it's in beta stage. Uh, the CRD will be recognized just like a CSI driver storage class will be recognized by the name of the CRD to point to the particular volume populator. Uh, you don't want, one thing you don't want to happen is that, okay, you have a backup that is created by storage window one and storage window two's volume populator takes in and try to read the data. And it's never gonna work. And it also introduces problems. Uh, then, uh, the volume populator controller will watch the PVC that has that data source field specified and is smart enough to say, oh, this is actually this specific volume populator's job. So they will pick up from the uh, volume, uh, the PVC, and start populating the data off the line. So uh, in order to support this, right, there are two things that are introduced. One is this called, is a library, is a volume populator, which uh, have all the logic allow a, a vendor to quickly build up uh, logic to, uh, and save the effort to watch all the PVCs or Kubernetes API level changes, et cetera, et cetera. And then there's a validator. And this validator is very important is because that uh, if you have a PVC that has a re data reference that has no corresponding CRD or no corresponding data populator to you know, help you recover the data, you you as an end user, you want to understand what's going on. So this validator is actually just to be there and tell you, okay, there's a matching one or there's not a matching one for uh, your volume recovery. Uh, this is the API. Uh, it look, does look uh, w w uh, pretty straightforward. And basic, at, at this stage, it's on beta in 1.24 and it's gated by this any volume data source feature gate in Kubernetes. Uh, if, if you want to try, try it out, turn on the feature gate, you should be able to plug in your volume populator and do all the volume backup and restore process in your case. And uh, the following are the steps how you can carry all these operations. Uh, with that, I'm going to shift it to Shin to continue our journey. Shin, please. This is the uh, next feature that we are working on. Uh, so CDT stands for change block tracking. This uh, identifies the blocks of data that have changed. This enables incremental backups. Without this, uh, a backup software will have to do full backups all the time, and that is uh, not space efficient, takes very long time to complete, and takes more bandwidth. Another use case is a snapshot-based replication where you periodically take snapshots and replicate that to a remote site for disaster recovery purpose. Without CBT, this solution will become 
highly inefficient. So what is the alternative? We don't have a common CPT API. We either have to do full backups all the time, or we have to call each story vendor's API to retrieve CPT. So this is uh, not ideal. Right now we do have a cap that's being reviewed. This is based on uh, aggregated API server because we try not to uh, save all the CPT records in the API server to overload that. However, there are concerns from the reviewer. Uh, there's uh, just, uh, even, even if we do not save those records in the API server, there still could be a big amount of uh, change blocks going through the aggregated API server. So right now we are looking into other design options. So Yvonne and Fang have been leading this project. And next I'm going to talk about backup repository. Backup repository is a location or a re repository used to save data. And there are two types of data that we need to save. One is the Kubernetes metadata, the other one is the snapshot data. So we need to uh, save them in this uh, backup repository so that we can use them at the restore time. Um, this can either be a object store or a or NFS or other storage location. It could be on-prem or in the cloud. There is a project, Cozy, container object storage interface that is aimed at supporting object storage in Kubernetes. Cozy introduces uh, uh, Kubernetes APIs to provision the buckets and also allow the pods to access those buckets. And also Cozy introduces uh, gRPC interfaces, allow a object storage vendor to write a plugin to provision and delete the buckets. There are several Cozy components. Uh, so we have a Cozy controller manager that binds the cozy created buckets to the bucket cleans. And also there is a sidecar that watches the cozy API objects and calls the cozy driver to provision buckets. And there is also uh, a driver uh, that is implemented by object storage vendor using the GRPC interfaces, uh, communicates with the storage backend to provision and delete buckets. So there are two sets of uh, Cozy Kubernetes APIs. The first set is bucket, bucket claim, and bucket class. So those are similar to the relationship between PV, PVC, and uh, storage class. And we also have a bucket access and a bucket access class. Those are for providing access to those buckets. As shown here, uh, so the bucket is a representation of a physical bucket in the storage backend. And the bucket claim is a user's request for a bucket. And we also have a bucket class that uh, is a type of uh, the bucket that you want to provision. So we support three protocols right now, S3, Azure, and uh, Google Cloud Storage. As shown here, we have a bucket access class uh, that specifies the authentication type. It can be a key or uh, AAM. And we also have a bucket access. In the bucket access, you specify the bucket access class name, the bucket claim name, uh, the credentials, and the protocol. And user just creates a pod with the project volume pointing to a secret in the bucket access, and the secret contains the bucket info uh, that is uh, in mounted at the specified location. Seed has been leading this project. Uh, there are also many other contributors for this project. This project reached alpha stage in 1.25 release. So the COSI team has been uh, having meetings every week uh, they are busy working on fixing bugs, working on documentation, and also trying to get more sorted vendors to write drivers. 
if you are a Spotify vendor, you have a object storage. Uh, so you are welcome to join the COSI team and write a driver. I uh, added the link here for our blog post for your reference. Uh, next, I'm going to talk about quest and uh, unquest hooks. We need this to ensure application consistency, to be able to quest the application before taking a snapshot and unquest afterwards. We looked into the quest and the unquest mechanism of different applications, and they all have different semantics. We want to design something that is a generic, uh, but the application-specific um, logic is out of scope. We do have a cap called container notifier that proposes a pod inline definition for you to run command inside a container. And this use case is actually general, it's uh, not limited to just quiet and unquiet. The cap is still being reviewed. Xiang Chen and myself are leading this effort. So next, I'm going to talk about consistent group snapshot. We talked about container notifier to achieve application consistency. So why do we still need uh, this uh, consistent group snapshot? But sometimes the application consistency is too expensive or um, you just uh, not possible to quiet the application. So you don't want to do it frequently, but still want to be able to uh, take a crash consistent snapshot frequently. Um, and also some applications want to be able to take a snapshot of multiple volumes at the same point in time. There is also a performance element here that if you can take a snapshot of multiple volumes at the same time, that is more efficient than take one snapshot at a time. So that's why we need a consistent group snapshot. And there is a cap that's been reviewed uh, targeting alpha in 1.26, I'm working on this cap. Uh, so this cap introduces several APIs, but actually two sets of uh, new APIs. Uh, there are one set of APIs for volume groups and uh, the other one is for volume group snapshot. Uh, volume group, this is a user's request for a group and the volume group content represents a, a group on a storage backend or it could be a logical grouping of volumes. And volume group class, uh, that specifies the type of the volume group. And similarly, volume group snapshot is a user's request for group snapshot of a group of volumes and a volume group snapshot content that uh, represents a, a group snapshot on the storage backend. Uh, and the volume group snapshot class that specify the type of the group snapshot you want. We are planning to introduce controllers that manages the life cycle of the volume group and the group snapshot. And also uh, we are proposing new GRPC interfaces in the CSS spec, uh, including create, delete, modify, list, get volume group and create, delete, list, get group snapshot. So moving on to application, snapshot, and backup. Uh, we already have uh, APIs to take a snapshot of individual volume, but what about a application? How do you do a snapshot and backup for that? And there is a cap that tries to define a stable application and propose a way to do a snapshot and uh, backup of that stable application. This is still in a very early stage of design. So I'm showing this uh, diagram again. Uh, as shown here, we have COSI that is alpha in 1.25 and uh, volume mode conversion that's in alpha state in 1.24 release. And we are also working on change block tracking consistent group snapshot, and so on. And in this uh, restore workflow, 
uh, we see those volume populator that is beta in 1.24. So compared to where we were two years ago when we first established this uh, volume group, we have made progress. Like cozy and volume populator, they were originally in the yellow boxes, meaning they are working progress, but now they are green. So we hope that we can turn more yellow and uh, orange boxes into green with your help. So here's our the homepage of the data protection working group. You can take a look and you can find a lot of information there. And we have bi-weekly meetings, we have mailing list and Slack channel. If you are interested, please uh, join us and get involved. Here's the QR code. We scan that and uh, provide feedback. That's the end of our session. Are there any questions? Sorry, I have to apologize. I missed one slide. Uh, the volume populator is actually led by Ben. I missed that piece completely. My apologies. Cool. We are open for questions, please. For example, if you are running uh, MySQL, uh, yeah, so. Oh, yeah. So can you elaborate the use cases for quests and then quests? Yeah, How sure. Do they yeah. Uh, so, when you look at the uh, MySQL, and you want You can still hear me? Okay. Uh, yeah. oh, all right. All right. Yeah. <sighs> so uh, before you back it up, before you take a snapshot, you want to quiet the application, right? So that you can take a application consistent snapshot. So you want to make sure your, your application is consistent, right? So when you restore it, you want to be able to still use that application. That's the reason for the quiet and unquiet. Yes, yeah, so I was just saying that every application, they have some different way of doing the quiet. Yeah, but, but the, uh, contain, the content notifier will, will uh, allow you to um, specify what commands you can run. Uh, I, can, I can just add a little bit on that aspect. Because imagine that uh, uh, you have, a, let's say, MySQL database, right? Uh, while your database is still serving right, you will keep a lot of states in your RAM, right? That's to achieve better performance. So MySQL actually allows you to say, stop accepting writes, flush my RAM to my disk, and then do whatever you wanna do, and then resume, right? This quiet hook is to guide, the, guide the process to be you know, atomic before and after you're taking the snapshot of the entire volume, so you get a full picture of that. Without that, it, will, it is possible that you will lose the state in your RAM, and it may also corrupt your data under, under uh, the persistent volume. That's the whole point of using quiet and unquiet hooks. to provide a more general mechanism, provide some common APIs. So currently without this, of course, they are doing it themselves. You, you also curious about why it is not scaling? Is that the question as well? storage in the storage system itself, is that what you're saying? Yeah, even if you're but but what I think the concern is even just to, to for that to um, 
pass through the APS server, that's even a concern, right? So it's not. We are actually also, uh, I want to uh, emphasize that this is only the control pass. We're not really talking about the data itself. Okay. Yeah. All good. Thanks for coming and uh, please join us. We need a lot of help. <laughs>